All right. Welcome to the study group. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you, Derek. Welcome, everyone at home. Today, we're going to be talking about Noah. And Noah takes a few routes here because the name is used a lot in the Rancher book. We're going to try to find a little bit of cohesiveness, but it's a really deep dive as far as the far reach this name has in our history and in religion and other things. But thankfully, we do have the Rancher book that kind of gives us a alternative and new revelation into where the flood concept comes from and how we might have interpreted that throughout history, especially some of uh, the religious groups and even new age occultists and archaeologists as well. Mm -hmm. So as I said, this is a big one to bite off. It is indeed. <laughs> but hopefully we can make an attempt and start the conversation going towards something that's more reflective of what the Rancho book showing mm -hmm. us here. Yes. This blending of myth and reality is kind of what we're trying to attempting to do. And it's, it spans a huge reach of history going back at least 200,000 years. So it's, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot to take on, but bear with us. Right, right. So essentially, let's just start with the name Noah. And here we have a nice image here of Noah. And we'll get into the uh, the one Noah who is kind of the star of the show here from the Arantia book. Uh -huh. But there's three Noahs that show up in the Arantia book. We're going to stay in accordance to the Arantia book here and how they might show up in history and throughout the Arantia book itself. So here I'm going to go to that first slide of the three Noahs. So we mm -hmm. have Noah, and this is how they show up in the Arantia book. So we have Noah, the son of the architect and builder of the first garden. So when we were talking about the first garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, uh, there was some design behind that. And Absolutely. the son of the architect who uh, designed that um, took up the reins of the job for mm -hmm. development of the, of the garden after his father passed away. So we have Noah, the son of the architect of the first garden. Then we have the Noah that everybody has heard about from Genesis, and that's as it shows up in the Old Testament, the 10th generation from Adam. So we have the Ark and the flood story adopted from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we'll get into that, which is a Sumerian tablet, Sumerian story. And then we have kind of the, the main Noah here, where the story is really about. And that's Noah of Aram near Eric or Uruk, as we might know. And interestingly enough, we'll get into that. Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk. But mm -hmm. so this story survived, uh, survived the flooding of the Euphrates Valley by building a houseboat for his family and animals in 5000 BC. And we'll get to some of the um, geographical reasons why it happened there and how it happened mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yes. So now as we move on, you're, we're also going to see this tale interwoven where it's there's these flood stories and flood myths that mm -hmm. just echo throughout all of history that people to this day continue to study and want to know more about, right? Right, right. So on this this slide, these epic floods and flood myths, this is kind of the roadmap for our podcast today. So you can pause and go back to this if it helps. But here we have the dates for these different major epic occurrences from the past. And a little, just a little bit of explanation, but we're reaching all the way back to Dalmatia, which was the first kind of uh, celestially assisted civilization on this planet that was established 500,000 years ago. But it was doomed by rebellion and sank beneath the Persian Gulf 200,000 years ago. So this goes way back, but there's echoes of this story that reverberate through a lot of the, you know, the mythology right the oral tradition preserved a lot of this over huge stretches of time so it's kind of awesome to see how these echoes reverberate up into these myths that, are, that came much later so then we have the first garden of eden that was the second attempt to create a higher civilization on this planet that was assisted by our celestial sponsors and that ended in default and that site also was submerged by flooding and that was more like thirty-two thousand bc so that was another huge sort of epic event, the flooding of the Mediterranean basin. And then we have flooding in the Euphrates Valley, which is where Adam went to keep the project going with the second garden. Mm 
That's where we showed where Cain came from. Right. In our last couple of podcasts, we talked a bit about that. Right. And that's also where, where we find the story of the actual Noah, <laughs> Noah of Aram, uh, with his houseboat. And that was somewhere around 5000 BC, from what we can tell. And then following that, we have the Gilgamesh flood myth. And the earliest versions of that that have been found on tablets are about 2600 BC. But the story itself has roots that go way back. And there were previous myths and poems and epics that, you know, sort of fed into that as well. But that brings in the, the region of Mount Ararat and became the prototype for the biblical Noah story. And then finally, we have the biblical Noah from Genesis. And um, that was written around 550 BC during the Babylonian captivity, even though it was referring to this, this Noah, which was presumed to be the 10th generation from Adam, which would actually have been back in the time of the first of the second garden around 32,000 BC. So the dates get complicated. You know, the, the, when the story was written, but what it was actually writing about uh, with these myths are two different things. So yeah. we'll try to shed a little bit of light on that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you're not lost. It's not yeah. a, a huge flood yet. You won't drown yet. But yeah. there are some important um, stars in this show. One is the name Noah. The other is this flood myth. Right. And how they're then interwoven into all of mythology and a lot of history on right. this planet. Right. So let's kind of so want to get into... Yeah, the next slide yeah. shows how these myths have been echoed and paralleled through time. Like the idea of a degraded culture being destroyed by flooding. I mean, that was sort of the idea with Noah and his ark. God tried to create this civilization, supposedly, and it turned out bad. He just wiped out the whole thing and just saved, you know, Noah and his family. Another reoccurring thing. Right. So, but we see that same pattern with Dalmatia, with the first garden, and also in the Gilgamesh flood myth, this idea of a degraded culture that was God had to wipe out by, <laughs> by flooding. And then uh, the other just interesting parallels, like the preservation of crucial plant and animal species. So we'll see as we go along that there are a couple of examples of that too, like with Adam going from the first to the second garden, very much like Noah's assignment in the biblical story, but on land. And then finally, we have these two winemakers who <laughs> survived flooding in a houseboat. You know, there's the Noah of Aram and then the Noah in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of a cute parallel or echo of one story into another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll get into all of these. Okay. Right. So, so maybe I could just kind of show you guys the map and yeah, we can kind of get that'd be great. positioned and s situated here. So essentially, we're going to work in in Mesopotamia, and we're going to go into where we've been before, and that's off the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, where we have first garden, mm -hmm. and then remember. Well, after, before that was Dalmatia. Right. So let, I'll show you. Yeah. So if we want to go um, in chronological order, if we go back to the Persian Gulf here, and near the mouth of the Persian Gulf. We have Dalmatia, the first civilization of a higher level. Some might refer to that as where the Anunnaki came or whatever. Then, in chronological order, Adam and Eve came much later, and we have the first Eden off the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And this is where that first Noah appears that we were talking about, the son of the architect of Eden. Okay. After the default, they moved eastward near Babylon, we might mm -hmm. say in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And this is the second garden, the second Eden. Now, remember, we went to the east where land of Nod, where Cain went. But now we're also going to go north of the second Eden. And we're going to go up into Turkey region near um, Lake Van. This is Lake Van right here, this big blue lake right here. And just to the northeast of Lake Van is now Mount Ararat. And Mar Mount Ararat is huge and stands out. You know, as you can see, this is a major mountain. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's where the both Gilgamesh and the Noah's Ark supposedly landed on Mount Ararat. Right. So this is an important geographical location. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let's zoom back out so everyone can kind of get an idea. So we're coming in. We're going to start working now here from the second from the second Eden because that's where mm -hmm. we kind of left off. And this is where a lot of in this flood story takes place. Right, because that area flooded also. These these river valleys here. Yes. Is where the major flood is. Particularly the Euphrates. So and, and we'll start to see that then this is Uruk. Uh-huh. And this is where then the Euphrates would flood and where we would have Noah as presented in the Urantia book. Right. But we'll right. get to that. And let's get to some slides then. I'll start reading. Sure. Go for it. Okay. So we're going to talk about Dalmatia a little bit here. 162, 162 years after the rebellion, a tidal wave swept up over Dalmatia and the planetary headquarters sank beneath the waters of the sea. So here's one big flood, right? Right. And that was approximately 200,000 years ago. Okay. When the first capital of the world, Dalmatia, was engulfed, it harbored only the lowest types of the Sangic races of Urantia, renegades who had already converted the father's temple into a shrine dedicated to Nag, the false god of light and fire. <laughs> so you could see the, the degradation of the world's first capital and then starting to feed into the story of how the whole world got bad, so God had to, had to wipe them out. Right. Concept. Right. So in paper 67, it says, the followers of Van, who was loyal, did not rebel early withdrew to the highlands west of India, from which place of retirement they planned for the rehabilitation of the world. Now, I know you're probably wondering, well, where does, is that? So let's go there. We're going to zoom back out, and here we are, the highlands west of India is something like in here. So here's the Copet Dog Mountains in here. And we're thinking it's somewhere. In, somewhere in that region. Somewhere in here, somewhere somewhere in there probably. Initially. So if we say this is the Caspian Sea right here to the left, east of the Caspian Sea, west of India in the highland regions near the Copet Dog Mountain. Mm -hmm. and, and again, remember, there's huge stretches of time involved here. And Van who was loyal, he was trying to preserve the project that was started in Dalmatia with his sad kick, Amadon. They had access to the Tree of Life so they could stay alive indefinitely. Yeah. So this project of rehabilitating the world, I mean, <laughs> talk about a, an assignment. <laughs> um, they sincerely undertook to do that. And did start centers of civilization scattered around in many places, 350 of them scattered around in different places. But eventually they became involved in the preparation for the garden for to receive Adam and Eve. And that's when then we move into that part of the story. So they relocated, obviously closer to the Mediterranean in order to undertake that project. But um, they were able to stay alive for such a long time period of time because they had access to the tree of life, which were then became replanted in the garden for Adam and Eve. Yeah, there are a lot of details in this. A lot it's of details. Complicated, not to take you off path here. So, But Van and Amadon, are, they came up in the earlier shows. They're crucial characters. Yeah. They're the ones that really preserved civilization between the fall of Dalmatia to the creation of the first garden. And we will probably do a show on yeah, well, rebellion and Dalmatia and things like that. There's a like whole sweep, sweeping timeline here, but that's a... <laughs> Very brief look. Yeah. All right. Well, let me read this next slide. So now we're talking about, then we're going to jump forward mm -hmm. and to the first garden after Dalmatia. So it's about 30, 150,000 years. Yeah. From, uh, from when Dalmatia went under it with a tidal wave or whatever. So this is about 34,000 BC, something like that, approximately. So soon after their awakening, I mean, they say that it was. 38,000 years ago that Adam and Eve came. Oh, okay. So somewhere around there. So they then they materialized here, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to wake up, and this is what they're talking about. 
Soon after their awakening, Adam and Eve were escorted to the formal reception on the great mound to the north of the temple. This natural hill had been enlarged and made ready for the installation of the world's new rulers. Here, at noon, the Urantia Reception Committee welcomed the son and daughter of the system of Satania. Amadon was chairman of this committee, which consisted of 12 members, including Noah, the son of the architect, the son of the architect and builder of the garden, and the executive of his deceased father's plans. So we see that the Urantia book is kind of giving us a little clue here as to one of the Noahs and perhaps maybe the origin story of the name Noah Could becoming be. popular on mm -hmm. this planet. But we learned that this first Noah, who popped up around, you know, 38,000 30, yeah, BC, mm -hmm. then um, he was the son of the architect of the first garden. Which is a major, uh, prestigious role that was undertaken by whoever his father was. But Noah then became the executive of his plan. So the, the garden wasn't finished at this point. It was partially built. So he was the one who carried on with the creation of trying to complete the building of the garden. Yeah. All right. So that's one Noah down. So one, <laughs> one down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's, all right. Let's go for two. So now we're going to uh, fast forward to, you know, um, not too much later. Yeah. But after the default of Adam and Eve, so maybe like 300 years later or something like that, 200, 300 years later, something like that. So as they defaulted, remember they defaulted and then they went east. And right. So they had to um, move and leave that first garden. Yeah, they left it undefended and went to create the second garden. Right. Okay. So this is them talking about that. And it says... After the first garden was vacated by Adam, it later became the dwelling place of the no northern Nodites. Who were descendants from the days of Dalmatia. Right. Remember, we talked about the land of Nod. Right. And that's their leader was Nod, and so that's why there are Nodites. Right. A whole race unto itself. So who are also like the Nephilim, perhaps, mm -hmm. in the Bible. And that's yeah. why a lot of this flood stuff comes up, but we'll get to it. So... After the first garden was vacated by Adam, it later became the dwelling place of the northern Nodites. The peninsula had been overrun by these lower grade Nodites for almost 4,000 years after Adam left the garden. When, in connection with the violent, the violent activity of the surrounding volcanoes and the submergence of the Sicilian land bridge to Africa, the eastern floor of the Mediterranean Sea sank carrying down beneath the waters the whole of the Edenic Peninsula. So the flooding of the peninsula came 4,000 years after that right. fall. So it's more like 34,000 BC. Right, when yeah, the, that's where I was getting The right flooding now. of yeah. the mm -hmm. Edenic Peninsula. And then it just says, this cataclysm of nature flooded scores of human settlements and occasioned the greatest loss of life by flood in all the world's history. So to the people of that time who were there, it may have seemed like the whole world flooded, <laughs> even though it didn't. But the, the, uh, the Mediterranean basin was populated. So this is the Mediterranean here. Right, right. And, you and can we can see where... You can see the, where the Sicilian land bridge used to be and then the Strait of Gibraltar. So you have the Strait of Gibraltar. Right. That broke. And then you, you have the Sicilian land bridge too. That right. Broke. And when that went down, then the whole thing flooded. And so that then, was it. Brought that whole that whole basin, the water level up to the up to the level of the of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And you see all of this submerged land, either in Greece, Italy, yeah. Africa, all over. There was civilizations in there. There were civilizations there. So when we talk about loss of life, right? And we talk about um, things like. Uh, the Atlantis story and other mm -hmm. flood myths. Who like knows? Yeah. yeah, they all have roots probably back to some of those real events. But again, we have these, what they refer to as the lower grade Nodites had taken over the peninsula where the first garden was located. So okay. that's another example of a sort of a degraded culture then being submerged by flooding. 
right, so, right. Uh, yet another echo. Yeah. Okay. And now here's another kind of tale of the echo of remember in Noah's Ark story where they Noah in the Ark where they talk about animals being shoveled mm -hmm. into the Ark and you know maybe some plants and seeds whatever. So this is kind of where we see it drawing from from the Arantia book where we have them leaving this first garden right mm -hmm. and they're going east to the second garden in babylon in between the tigers and euphrates as we've shown on the map so as they're in route what they're what they're bringing it says adam's caravan had carried the seeds and bulbs of hundreds of plants and cereals of the first garden with them to the land between the rivers they also had brought along extensive herds and some of all the domesticated animals. Because of this, they possessed great advantages over the surrounding tribes. They enjoyed many of the benefits of the previous culture of the original garden. So this transferring things and caring and mm -hmm. uh, preserving. Preserving. Yeah, know. yeah. Because Adam was a master. I don't know what you'd call it, horticulturalist or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. he understood plants. He understood everything. And they had built up this whole culture of, of, of gardening. And he wanted to preserve as much of that as he could. So it's again, it's like almost like he was assigned by God. I mean, he took this on himself, but trying to preserve the best of what remained from this previous attempt at creating civilization. So it's another sort of echo of the Noah story, mm -hmm. only it's they're transported over land rather than in a big boat. But it's the same concept, mm -hmm. which is super interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to find a lot of these little tales that were eventually edited into the Noah story. Yeah. I'll try to put it together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about the region where the second garden was, as we showed, in between the Tigris and the Euphrates, right there near mm -hmm. Babylon. And much, we're going to fast forward in time now a little bit more, right? Because we're looking around 5000 BC. Right. The, the, um, weather patterns and geographic move, tectonic movements and whatnot was going on. That flooding of the Mediterranean basin changed everything, it's not, you know, ge geologically in that whole region, as we'll read here. Right. Okay. So talking about the Euphrates Valley, they say, but new perils threaten the valley of Mesopotamia as a result of progressive geologic changes to the north. So remember, we're talking about if you want to go to the map... There's the first Eden. That's the Mediterranean. But now we're now we're working from the second garden, which is in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. So if we're looking at the north, northern Mesopotamia, we're going to have some probably bigger mountain growth development. And mm -hmm. who knows what other tectonic activity is going on up there. Mm -hmm. And with that, let me read this next quote. For thousands of years, after the submergence of the first Eden, the mountains about the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and those to the northwest and northeast of Mesopotamia continued to rise. This elevation of the highlands was greatly accelerated about 5000 BC. And this, together with greatly increased snowfall on the northern mountains, caused unprecedented floods each spring throughout the Euphrates Valley. So if we go back and we look at all the snowfall that was going on up north and then down into the rivers, mm. and as well as then those plains being lower and lower as the, the elevations going higher and higher of, the, of these mountains, then you're gonna get a lot of snowfall runoff mm -hmm. that's gonna start to flood these rivers and flood these plains in here. Exactly. All right, so now we get the. <laughs> <coughs> Let me continue here. Yeah. <clears throat> now the real Noah. <laughs> yeah, right. Here we go. <laughs> but Noah really lived. He was a winemaker of Aram, a river settlement near Eric or Uruk. He kept a written record of the days of the river's rise from year to year. He brought much ridicule upon himself 
by going up and down the river valley, advocating that all houses be built of wood, boat fashion, and that the family animals be put on board each night as the flood season approached. Finally, a year came in which the annual floods were greatly augmented by unusually heavy rainfall, so that the sudden rise of the waters wiped out the entire village. Only Noah and his immediate family were saved in their houseboat. <laughs> so it's kind of a, uh, uh, a blessing that they would reveal this to us about mm -hmm. how it really went down. And mm -hmm. it makes sense if you look at what was going on in that region. Yes. And Uruk being right where it was and the town of Aram being there, that village got wiped out, but they survived due to that. It's also interesting that they throw in the detail that he was a winemaker right. and river surveyor. Uh -huh. That's pretty cool. So you could see that why he might draw a lot of ridicule. Yeah, I don't <laughs> trust that guy. He's been drinking all day, you know. He's been drinking his product. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I do appreciate that, you know, we get kind of this like tangible, real yeah. story that's believable. Right. right. Well, and the Noah and the biblical story is also, you know, he had vineyards in the mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. after the flood. You know, and was drunk, and there's a whole story around that. Yeah. So yeah. there's winemaking with associated with both Noahs. Yeah, you're right. Which is interesting. But a different character around them, and yeah, we'll different. get into it. But but just a kind of an echo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to read some slides? Sure. Okay. All right. So now they point out that again they're, they're speaking of around 5,000 BC. Just, We're going to stay at 5,000 just to BC. keep the time yeah. frame in mind here. They go on to say that these floods, these flood, this flooding of the Euphrates Valley, these floods completed the disruption of Andite civilization. So the Andites were the offspring, the of later the, offspring. Of the Nodites and the Adamites. And right. the reason why they were there is because that's where they blended, right? So they were right. called the pre-Sumerian Nodites. And that's why the Sumerians were so badass or whatever. Yeah. Because they had such and then the Andites incredible lineage. Mixing in Adams. Uh, you know, blood into that. So it was a high civilization. Yeah. So these floods completed the disruption of Andite civilization, which had centered there in the Mesopotamian, I mean, in the Euphrates Valley. With the ending of this period of deluge, the second garden was no more. So this then wiped out the second garden. Only in the south and among the Sumerians did any trace of the former glory remain remain so they're strongly implying that there is this is a glorious civilization you know that we've completely almost lost touch with i mean there's little hints of it but the remnants of the second garden one of the oldest civilizations are to be found in these regions of mesopotamia and to the northeast and northwest but still older vestiges of the days of dalmatia exist under the waters of the persian gulf and the first Eden lies submerged under the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. So here we're getting kind of a quick historic summary of these three civilizations, the three highest civilizations on the planet up to that time. And they're also giving us clues that they might be some, there might be some artifacts left. Oh, where absolutely. We could find. Yeah, yeah. These are big clues for archaeologists where to look to mm -hmm. find remnants of these civilizations. All right, going on to the next slide here. So now we're backing up a little bit, 10,000 years ago. So remember, we were talking about Van and the Vanites. So 10,000 years ago, the Vanite ancestors of the Assyrians, so we're getting into the Gilgamesh flood myth, so we're kind of changing gears here. 10,000 years ago, the Vanite ancestors of the Assyrians taught that their moral law of seven commandments had been given to Van by the gods upon Mount Ararat. So you can see another parallel here with, you know, Moses and the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, right? But here we have uh, what's going to turn out to be Gilgamesh and the uh, receiving of their moral laws on Mount Ararat. And then they point out that Mount Ararat was the sacred mountain of, the no of northern Mesopotamia. And since much of your tradition of these ancient times was acquired in connection with the Babylonian story of the flood, it is not surprising that Mount Ararat 
and its region were woven into the later Jewish story of Noah and the universal flood. So here on the map, let's mm -hmm. see. Here we are in the Mediterranean again. We're going to come in, and here's the second garden in between the Tigris and Euphrates. And directly north, here we are, Mount Ararat. Remember we showed in the beginning? Right, right next to so Lake this, Van almost. So this is why you would see such loyalty or, or such homage to Mount Ararat, I believe, because right. this is the region where the loyalists to Van lived. Mm -hmm. So this is a really sacred, important area. Mm -hmm. Right. And that mountain is just really impressive. Yeah, you, <laughs> you got can, a slide of that. Yeah. You can see it's just towering over this cathedral over here near the shores of Lake Van. That's uh -huh. how big that thing is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see why they would hold that mountain in special regard, even to the point of having their <laughs> arcs land on it. Okay, so here we're getting a little more into the Gilgamesh flood myth. And here we have, uh, this is information from online sources, where they say that the Epic of Gilgamesh was rediscovered in the library of Ashurbanipal in 1849. And that's in northern Mesopotamia, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It includes the Gilgamesh flood myth. So this wasn't even discovered until 1849. In January 19... Uh, 1902, the German Assyriologist Frederick Dillitz gave a lecture in which he argued that the flood story in the book of Genesis was directly copied from the one in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And this created a huge storm of controversy sure. yeah. at the time. Anyway, and then, then they, uh, and they also point out that a short reference to the flood myth is also present in much older Sumerian Gilgamesh poems, from which the later Babylonian virgins drew much of their in inspiration and subject matter. So this Gilgamesh flood myth is really interesting because it, dr it draws on sources that were even much older. So it's kind of a composite of stories that have been passed down through oral tradition from much earlier times. Yeah, and that's the beauty of the Urantia book here that we're trying to reveal here is that where these stories maybe originated from. Right. They Not just, just one generation before that or one story before that. It was, we're going back 500,000 years. It could wiggle way back. Yeah. Right. So then uh, here's a picture of this tablet that was found. The British Museum offers this commentary about the tablet where they say that this tablet is perhaps the most famous of all cuneiform tablets. It is the 11th tablet of the Gilgamesh epic and describes how the gods sent a flood to destroy the world. Like Noah, Utnapishtim was forewarned and built an ark to house and preserve living things. So here we can see how this is very much like the Noah story, but it's about Gilgamesh. And on the right-hand side of this a slide, we have a representation of Gilgamesh. And you can see that he's quite a formidable character. He was like a mythical, godlike leader and ruler from those long ago days. And he's even has this lion, which is one of his signature, I don't know, uh, companions or part of that story from those days. It's cool that we start to see, you know, maybe even specific details in the story yeah. yeah and you know if you ever read the epic of gilgamesh you'll see some really cool um parallels with your rancher book as well uh -huh. if you have an eye for it and i'll give a plug for the fellowship too the rancher book fellowship if you're in chicago during ic 23 this mm. july then you can go to the university of chicago and go to the oriental institute there and actually look at this tablet mm -hmm. as your rancher book says their tablets dusty tablets on the shelves of the museum. Well, this is one of them over there. Yeah. You might want to check that out. And if you look at that tablet, I mean, the writing, if you just look at that writing, how do you even understand that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. fascinating. Okay, so we're going to move from there now into the story of Noah's Ark, the one that everybody knows. So this is from the Urantia, back to the Urantia book. So they say that almost 5,000 years later, so this is 5,000 years later from 5,000 years ago, 
approximately, but actually what they're referring to is around 550 BC during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, so at this point in time, and that's what they're referring to, 5,000 years after the flooding of the Euphrates Valley, as the Hebrew priest in Babylonian captivity sought to trace the Jewish people back to Adam, they found great difficulty in piecing the story together. <laughs> Small wonder. So do we. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it occurred to one of them to abandon the effort to let the whole world drown in its wickedness at the time of Noah's flood, and thus to be in a better position to trace Abraham right back to, to one of the three surviving sons of Noah. So this is a strategy of storytelling, trying to create this coherent narrative out of you know historic realities that are really hard to reconcile. By piecemealing a lot of yeah. things together. Right, exactly. It's Inclu a, bri a bric-a-brac origin story. Right, including everything that we're learning from these tablets that they found in Babylon. It was quite a mosaic, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, right. Didn't <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good pun. All right. So then finally, we have this comment about uh, traditions. They say, the, the ranch book tells us the traditions of a time when water covered the whole of the Earth's surface are universal. So this wasn't unique to the, either the Jewish people or to Sumerians or to any of these stories. These stories were widespread. And we can see why, because there were these many epic floods. Yeah. The biblical story of Noah, the ark, and the flood is an invention of the Hebrew priesthood during the Babylonian captivity, but weaving together existing stories that they found while they were there. There has never been a universal flood since life was established on Urantia. The only time the surface of the earth was completely covered by water was during those archaeozoic ages before the land had begun to appear. So the whole idea of the entire earth being covered by water, you know, at a time when there was civilization present is just, you know, that's not geologically or archaeologically plausible. But nonetheless, there have been these major floods. So they guys just sort of got exaggerated <laughs> to make the story more dramatic. And that part of the story in all of these is that there was a degraded civilization that God had tried to create, was disappointed, and decided to destroy. Yeah. Yeah. And that there was an attempt by God or deity, like in Gilgamesh, it was Anki. And in other circumstances, there's these attempts to preserve knowledge and preserve history and story and things that you don't want taken off the planet. And, I, you know, we were talking about this. I personally feel that's what the Urantia book is. Mm -hmm, right. You know? It's like an arc that we intellectually are going to build here in society through the quality uh -huh. of thinking yeah. and giving us our story back and reserving, preserving certain mm -hmm. stories like Jesus and history and all sorts of things. Right. right. So it's kind of like, not to sound so corny, but those of us who are trying to share this Urantia book and the teachings in the Revelation in our own lives, how we integrate it and how we teach, it's like building a little ark. It's building an ark for our society to preserve, maintain, and move forward. Yeah, building a civilizational vessel <laughs> that can carry on successfully into the future and preserve this higher understanding of our very nature and God's involvement with this project that we have creating civilization on this planet. So that's all real. Yeah. But we have, fortunately, in the Arantia book, this preservation of crucial what amounts to stories and information, but it's kind of like preserving the, you know, the fruits and the trees and the animals. It's, right. it's what we need in order to build this new civilization on this planet. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good foundation for that. So yeah. it's an exciting prospect. Yeah. So there's a project to be a part of. You know, yeah, we all have we can play a part in building an ark. But it's also sobering to know from our history that there have been many attempts in the past that have not succeeded. I mean, maybe they succeeded to some extent and the best in some ways was carried forward from those. But it's it's, you know, this is dangerous, difficult work to build <laughs> civilization. Build a civilization that will endure is not a small, <laughs> yeah. not a small feat.
and can easily be taken down. You're right. 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 All right. Well, hopefully we did some kind of justice to this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, as you can see, it's been piecemealed together throughout our history, but uh -huh. there are echoes. And thanks to the Urantia book, we have some real, yeah, some real opportunities to even find some of these locations too. Right. So. Right. And we'll pick up on more aspects of the story too in future shows. That'll be fascinating. Absolutely. All right. Well, until next time, if you have any comments or anything like that, that maybe some ideas of some other historical figures you might want to study, we're talking about maybe Adamson. Adamson would be a good one. And we'll see where we go from there. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. God bless. See mm -hmm. you next time. Next time.